The Harris County Jail is the biggest mental health facility in the state of Texas. Is there a better, more ethical way to treat and help our mentally ill than housing them in a jail? What's going to happen to our mental health system if the, if the legislature goes through with its promise to cut property taxes, taking money straight out of the county coffers? And what's going to happen with the Astrodome? All this and more tonight on Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association's Reasonable Doubt, featuring County Judge Ed Emmett. I'm Chris Tritico, past president of the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association, here to welcome you tonight. Now sit back and enjoy the show. Here's your hosts, Damon Parrish and Jimmy Ardwan. Thank you, Chris, for that stirring introduction. We appreciate you filling in tonight for Carmen. Welcome to the program, everybody. It's going to be a great one tonight. As Chris said, we have Harris County Judge Ed Emmett with us, and he's going to be talking all issues surrounding Harris County's criminal justice system tonight. And uh, we're going to be taking your questions live on the air, both via the phone and via Twitter. You can reach us at HCCLA underscore TV on Twitter. And we really want you to send in your questions. We'll take them live here on the air for Judge Emmett. And you can call us at 713-807-1794. We'll open up the phones around the 830 uh, portion of the hour and take your calls live on the air. I want to bring in my co-host right now, Damon Parrish. Damon, good evening. How are you? Pretty good yourself. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Excited. We I am getting excited. We have a big guest, guest tonight. So uh, let's, let's no further delay. Let's get right to it. Let's bring in the the guest of the evening, Harris County Judge Ed Emmett. Pleasure to have you with us. Good evening. Appreciate good you evening. joining the show. Uh, let's start off with the first thing. You are not an actual judge. We're going to get that out of the way. Right. Not not in a legal sense. Uh, I, I hear no cases. I wear no robes. Uh, the county judge in the state of Texas. I love telling people from out of state this. County judge in the state of Texas, uh, anywhere else would be called a county executive. But even that's not quite right because the the county is run by the county judge and the, the four county commissioners jointly. And it's called the commissioner's court, but it's not a court. So I'm called judge, but I'm not a judge. And I preside over a court, but it's not really a court. And if you follow all that, you're really smart. I guess the best way to say it, it, it would function more like in a, in a city you're the mayor and they're kind of the city council. That would be kind of the best analogy, It right? would be the best analogy. Not entirely accurate, but it would be the best analogy. The closest thing right. we have. Right. You guys determine the budget issues surrounding the county and how the money is distributed to the service. And we program. set policy for the county. Right. Right. And so going along those lines, what Chris talked about in the intro was the mental health uh, programs that we have here in Harris County and how the Harris County Jail is the largest mental health facility in the state. And I know this is something that is near and dear to your heart. Uh, and I, I, I kind of want to start with, are we doing enough in Harris County with our mental health programs? No, absolutely not. And uh, mental health is, is my personal passion. Uh, it has been really ever since I became county judge. And I realized that the, the county jail is the largest mental health facility in the state of Texas. In the late 70s and early 80s, I was in the legislature. and. I go back to those days when pe people with mental conditions were pretty much warehoused in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. You know, we put them away, out of sight, therefore, you know, we didn't have to deal with them. The legislature made a great decision years later to deinstitutionalize the mentally ill. So we quit warehousing people in the state, but unfortunately, the legislature then didn't really do anything to help them. So if you come from a, a wealthy family or a family that has the ability to take care of you, then you're covered. But there are a lot of people who don't fit in that. And so when I became county judge, one of the first things we noticed uh, was we have so many people in the jail who they're really, their problem is they have a mental condition. It's not that they're any kind of a hardened criminal. So we asked the question a couple years ago, how many people have been arrested in a two-year period at least five times? Right. Five times. And is this, this is what you would call a frequent flyer? Frequent flyers. Right. The number came out over 8,000 just in Harris County. 
And that is a horrible thing for the person involved, clearly, but it's a horrible thing for the taxpayer because it costs a lot more money to deal with somebody in the criminal justice system than it does in MHMRA or mental health. So uh, we went to the legislature and, and Senator Huffman and Representative Sinfronia Thompson carried the legislation, but it had broad bipartisan support to create a jail diversion project in Harris County to where if we know who these people are, the next time we pick them up, rather than running them back through the criminal justice system, we divert them into the mental health world so that they can get the help they need. And that pilot project's now just uh, finishing up its first year. And, and I noticed on, in looking at the budget that there's a grant for about $175,000, and I think that comes probably from the state, correct? That the state gives a grant to the county to help out in those sort of things? For the jail diversion? Uh, it, it well, actually, well, actually is larger than that. It's, okay. it's $5 million. Okay, because what I saw was a felony mental health grant. Okay, that's does. for a felony mental health court. Okay. And, and yes, we're trying to focus, but... Uh, and what does that 175, what does that go to? Because that seems kind of low to fund I think court. that I think that just goes to provide a person in the court okay. that, you know, handles the cases. Gotcha. But so, but the other, the jail diversion project is funded to the tune of $5 million. And what are you expecting from the jail diversion project? To come up with a system uh, that we can then scale to statewide so that we have a database of people who their real issue is mental, and next time we see them, we don't run them through the same revolving door of criminal justice. You know, the, the sheriff's office, for example, when they let somebody go at the end of their sentence, they lose control. All they can do is sort of pat them on the head and say, go have a nice life. Well, if we can, before we let those people go, to put them over into a system, MHMRA, Systems of Hope, any number of places, and get them the help they need, then the idea is we won't see them again being arrested and back in the criminal justice system. So comparatively speaking, do you know how much it costs for the uh, two-year span when we have the same 8,000 people being rearrested five times? Do you know how, how much did that cost the taxpayer for that? For it, that? It's hard to figure exactly, but, but if you use a, a rough figure of 350 to $500 a day to deal with somebody in the criminal justice setting in the jail, versus 30 to 40 dollars a day in MHMRA. That, that's pretty clear savings right there. But beyond that, it's the long-term savings. Most people with mental conditions really can function. Right. And we need them to be functioning in society at whatever level they can. Uh, you can't do that if you're constantly being arrested. And, and really, let's be honest, I mean, the, the jail, Sheriff Garcia and the officers over there they're not equipped to handle and and care for mental mental health defendants, are they? They're they're not. They are to a degree. They are. Okay. Uh, but it's not the ideal setting, and they they really do a pretty good job, because we have a staff there that uh, can identify the the mental issues, can prescribe medication, get them on the meds, uh, whatever their problem is, they can get them stabilized. But once they let them go, they don't have any control. Where do they normally, once they, there, there's no release plan, is what you're no. saying. There's, we, we don't yeah. have a, a segue to take them from the jail to, say, you know, a, I guess would be a, some sort of Star of Hope type place, somewhere that, that you can kind of monitor them as a go-between before they're released And, back. and that is our hope. Uh, you know, the, the voters approved the Joint Processing Center, barely, <laughs> which is <laughs> remarkable that anybody voted against that. But... The reason it's called a joint processing center rather than just a joint booking center is we envision that people be processed on their way out as well as on their way in. We're not there yet, but, but we're working toward that. So is this the first step in a, a more global uh, initiative for health care, or is this just to stop the recidivism rate for the, uh, the jail system? Well, hopefully it, it's a step in part of the whole process. Uh, mental health, you know, for years... If you have something wrong with your kidney, you know, that's not an embarrassing thing. You go get it treated. Well, if you have something wrong with your brain, it's just another organ. And, and the world is now beginning to accept that. Uh, every time I give a speech, I manage to work mental health into it. And I, I, I say, don't raise your hands, but how many of you either have a family member, a neighbor, or a friend who has some mental condition? It may be very minor or it may be major. And I've 
I bet everybody in that room knows somebody. Right, right. That $5 million number, $5 million number you discussed before, is that comes from the coffers of Harris County? There's no, no, that no comes outside. from the legislature. Okay. Legislature gave a grant. We match I see. the grant. And uh, that's what I mean. The, the legislature across the board, I mean, everybody from the most conservative Republican to the most liberal Democrat has pretty much agreed that mental health is an issue we need to address. Well, and Chris, in, in the intro, alluded to the fact that the legislature is contemplating cutting the property taxes here in the state. What what impact will that have on the ability to fund programs like this? I mean, are, are, are these kind of programs ones that will be the first to get on the chopping block? Well, I hope not, but it would make a decision. You know, it would clearly give every county a decision point. Uh, I'm going to say several things about the legislature and tax cuts. When people say, elect me to the legislature, I'm going to cut your property taxes, and the state doesn't even have a property tax. Right. Then I go, well, wait a minute. How are you going to do it? Schools, counties, but from a county perspective, which is all I'll talk about, basically the only funding we get is a property tax. Now, if the legislature wants to change that, that's fine. But why cut the only tax that we have, particularly when we're in such a rapidly growing urban area? And I'm, I've started reminding people, Harris County is unique. We have about 1.8 million people who live in unincorporated Harris County, where there's no city government at all. By the year 2018, if all the trends continue, more people will live in unincorporated Harris County than live inside the city of Houston. City gets sales tax. City has ordinance making power. We don't get sales tax. We don't have ordinance making power. You know, we can't ban fireworks, all kinds of things. So we've got to come up with a new system of urban governance. And if the best that the legislature can do is cut the property tax that's available to us, then that's almost a recipe for disaster. Not just mental health, transportation, and everything else. And I think you kind of spoke upon that with something you called suburban poverty. Is that, right. is that the same issue there? It's absolutely the same issue. Uh, you know, I moved to Harris County in 1966, just before my senior year at Bel Air High School. And in those days, you could say, this is where poor people live. This is where wealthy people live. This is where middle class, you know, you, you could identify neighborhoods. Since that time, because of the four and a half million people who live in Harris County, about half million live inside Loop 610, million and a half live between Loop 610 and Beltway 8, and over two million live outside Beltway 8. Well, among those two million are a lot of people, frankly, that are living at or below the poverty line. They're in neighborhoods that at one time may have been nice, but they're not. And unfortunately, the resources that are available uh, to people in need tend to be down in, in the urban core. So yeah, we have something called suburban poverty. And that's why we're trying to get the neighborhood clinics to move out, uh, any of the help organizations to realize there are a lot of people out there in those suburbs that need help. And I guess that's kind of a good segue into to the next area I want to get into, and that is the rapid growth of Harris County and the effect that that will be on the county's ability to, to adequately provide uh, a full functioning criminal justice system. I mean, as, as the, you've got a lot of agencies, obviously, you've got to find constables, sheriffs, the district attorney's office. Now we have a public defender's office. I mean, we've got a, a number of agencies the county now. Courts. The county courts. Um, you know, in addition to the civil side. Uh, so we've got a number of things, and I, I just want to kind of get from you a sense of where you see the biggest challenges on the criminal justice side with with the county's enormous growth. Well, it, it is just a. It becomes just a matter of numbers, <clears throat> and what has happened over the years. The county really has you know, about four basic functions. Criminal justice is one. Uh, let me back up and say, the county as an arm of the state can only do what the state tells it it can do. And so, like I said, we don't have ordinance making power. So the state mandates that, that we handle criminal justice. You know, we have the DA, we have the jails, we have all that. Uh, we handle flood control because we have the Harris County Flood Control District, so that came in. The state mandates that we handle indigent health care which I hope we'll get to talk about that a little bit later on. And we're responsible for providing the transportation infrastructure in this rapidly growing county. So if you start cutting our resources, where do we cut? Flood control, transportation, indigent health care, 
criminal justice, it's a hard decision. Yeah, and I guess one of the big questions, obviously, that we see every day as criminal practitioners is just the massive humanity coming down to the criminal courthouse every day. I mean, I'm sure it hasn't escaped your radar that the, law, the lines just to get in the criminal justice center wrap around the building right. for sometimes five days a week. And we've got this crush of people all coming at the same time. Um, I mean, there's got to be some, some, some fixes, some simple fixes to eliminate that because those lines are only going to grow. Well, part, part of those lines are the result of not having enough elevators in the building, right. uh, which is, that's fixable and, and we need to do it. Uh, but, you know, all security requirements have changed too. I mean, Security is a much tighter situation now. So processing people. But uh, to put it in perspective, Harris County has more people than 24 states. And so if you said a state is going to have all of its courthouses right down here in this downtown area, in, in, you know, in, you, you would be shocked to find a state in that circumstance. Do you, do you think that there's a way, and I, I don't know how much power or sway the commissioner's court has over the, the county court judges or the district judges in terms of running the courthouse officially, if, if more efficiently, but does it seem a situation where perhaps we could eliminate the need for defendants to come down to the courthouse once a month? That that would potentially help with the, I mean, the security concerns you're talking about, if we eliminate the number of people coming into the courthouse, less people to be scanned? You know, that, that's not something I'm probably qualified to even answer. We do have a criminal justice coordinating council that uh, Commissioner El Franco Lee chairs and Commissioner Raddick is on. And those are the kind of things that need to be suggested, and I'm, I'm sure they'll look at them. There's been rumor while we're on the CJC, the, the Justice Building, that there might be an addition of a, an additional county court. I mean, is that in the pipeline as well to help with the overcrowding and the population? There, there is discussion of that, and of course, that has to be created again by the. So is it is this something likely to happen in the future? Is it just kind of batted around, or, or? No, I think it's likely to happen, I, and not just one. But I mean, as we grow, we're, we're adding thousands of people all the time. So yes, we have to keep adding. And uh, you know, at another level of criminal justice, the the JP courts, mm -hmm. you know, the imbalance between those. I mean, some of those have hundreds of thousands of cases, and the others just have a few. Uh, there needs to be something done to equalize that too. Now, th there's been a lot of talk in the news lately about marijuana, legalizing it, decriminalizing it, and the like. If it were to be de decriminalized or legalized in Texas, wouldn't that help with the, with the issue of creating a different county court? You know, if we cut a third of the docket, we wouldn't need as many courts. I mean, with that, do you think that would help out as well? Or Well, sure, without weighing in on the merits of it one way or the other, any time you took a, a uh, criminal offense off the books that gets as many people in jail as that does, then sure, that would reduce the numbers. I want to go back to one of the things you mentioned um, when we were talking about the budget as Harris County grows, and that's the transportation. The, the county is responsible, the commissioner's court is responsible for determining the transportation needs of the county um, and helping the infrastructure, growing the infrastructure. And one of the things, Harris County obviously has been a leader, if not the leader in Texas for uh, DWI related crashes, uh, deaths, all of that. Um, we're constantly in the news and at, at the top of it. The urban sprawl and the lack of mass transit. If we could address those, wouldn't that solve some of those numbers and help drive those numbers down? Oh, uh, potentially. Uh, but we are just scrambling to keep up with the growth right now when it comes to transportation. Now, if you ask me to, not as county judge, just put on my former transportation consultant hat, sure. you know, I'd have Metro county-wide. You know, we have pockets. Right. Uh, I would have a, a metro system that tied to a commuter rail system. Right now, though, the metro system doesn't go far enough out to really tie in to the suburban, so the, 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 the rail part of it anyway. The buses do. Uh, I think back to the days when the Katy Railroad went out of business or was merged. TxDOT took over the right-of-way of the Katy rail line. It ran from Katy all the way into downtown, paralleling I-10. They offered that to Metro, and Metro said, we don't want it. 
Now think if we had a commuter rail line that came from Katy all the way into downtown. How many people would ride that every day? Yeah. A lot. Thinking a lot, yeah. A lot. Uh, we need to constantly be moving on, on transportation projects. Uh, and, you know, for example, US 59 has been redesignated I-69. There needs to be a bypass. That bypass needs to be east of town so that it would serve the ports of Freeport, Galveston, Houston, and get all that truck traffic that's coming into and out of the ports out of the congested area. Um, and we're working on that. But it, that has to be a county, state, everybody needs to be involved in that. Well, when you're addressing the infrastructure needs, how much of criminal justice issues are factoring into that equation as far as DWIs, car break-ins, just how, how many of those issues factor in? Uh, little, frankly. It all becomes a question of traffic. Right. Uh, what are you going to do to help move traffic? Now, uh, if I were in the legislature and you asked me that question, we've got to do something about DWIs. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in the UK over the years. And over there, if you get caught one time on a, on a DWI, it's a serious matter. And as a result, almost n nobody, no, no two couples are going to go out without designating somebody as a, as a designated driver. We don't take it that seriously here. In fact, we have uh, one of the local radio personalities who tells people to pop a top while they're driving home. I mean, you know. Well, I found it amazing that the city fought so hard to get Uber approved to operate in this town. It seems like we need more of Uber type of businesses operating because the taxis, they, they can't sufficiently handle the need. So uh, what what kind of programs You're going to try and drag me into the Uber <laughs> taxi fight. Well, I just no, well, I just want to find out and I'm not looking for you to get into a fight on that, but I, I want to find out what can what solutions have been discussed to help add to that and 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 be part of the solution rather than, you know, kind of dragging and and contributing to the problem. As I mentioned, I, I used to travel internationally a lot. And Houston Intercontinental Airport, Bush Intercontinental Airport's great airport. But if I'm flying into there from overseas and I've never been here before, I'm going to be shocked that there's no rail connection mm -hmm. to downtown or to anywhere. Yeah. There may be a bus, but it's not real clear how to get there. About your only option is to go out and get in a taxi. Uh, it's an unusual situation, but we're going to have to get serious about our transportation needs and, and dealing with them. And now we're so spread out, it's not just a, a hub and spoke situation because with the opening of the ExxonMobil North American campus, for example, on the far north side, the traffic between that facility and the west side of town, the energy corridor, is going to be huge. And so the county, most of that's in unincorporated Harris County, the county commissioners have to figure out how to deal with it. The one thing we have going for us is the Harris County Toll Road. Uh, people don't like paying tolls. I mean, that's another thing. I've got to say this. Uh, whether you're talking about legislators or other public officials, they say, we're not going to raise your gas tax to pay for new roads, and we don't want you to have to pay tolls either. Well, I don't know. Do they think there's a ferry on high that's going to come down and build that road? I mean, something's got to pay for it. So uh, the toll road system in Harris County the way it was designed as a system. It will never be paid off, and that really irritates some people, but it allowed the money from the West Belt to be used to build the East Belt, because otherwise the East Belt would never have been built. And so I just ask people to imagine, where would we be without Beltway 8, Hardy, West Park? I found it uh, entertaining to go back and look. I wasn't here at the time, but when West Park was built, West Park was built uh, people said it's a road to nowhere. Nobody's going to use it. And now, now the com now the complaints are, I can't believe you didn't build this road bigger. <laughs> right, yeah. it's always and, a complaint. And Judge, I don't want to, I don't want to go back to the DWI issue, but it's, Harris County spends a lot on DWIs as far as the, the intervention program, just task force officers with task force and overtime with the ALR hearings, with no refusal weekends, um, and I'm just I, I'm curious is do you, would that money not be better spent with like transportation issues or, or other issues of that nature? Has that come into play that maybe then prosecuting we could use it for prevention? I don't know how you divert that money though unless the legislature 
gets really serious about cracking down on DWI. And we're just not there yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you get away with DWI. I mean, it's heartbreaking every time you, you have a wrong way driver and you realize that person's been arrested five or six times for DWI. Well, you know, why are they still on the road? We, we've got to find a way to, to get those people off the road. One of the things that I, um, I guess I struggle with from a, from, a, from a county standpoint is the bail bond situation. And I don't know how much attention that, that has, of that has come across your desk, but... Very uh, little. We, we, we have a situation where we have a bail bond schedule that's been set forth by either the county judges, the county criminal court judges, or the district court judges. Um, and it's, it, it basically mandates that a bond must be set in every case. And kind of going back, I want to. I kind of want to tie this into what you talked about with indigent, uh, indigent health and indigent defense is where where I want to go with this. Um, not everybody can afford a five hundred dollar bond, and so we have people that are stuck either in through mental health and, and they're <coughs> stuck in jail, right. and and they can't get a bond, they can't get out, they sit there, and and we we've got the jail overcrowding issue. What can, is there any way that the commissioner's court can get involved to press the, a PR bond issue? Not to my knowledge, but again, that might be something that Commissioner Lee, Commissioner Raddick, the whole Criminal Justice Coordinating Council could take up. Is it but something that, that... It, hadn't, it hasn't really crossed my desk at all. Okay. Wow. That's, a, that's, that's kind of shocking to me because that seems to me like a, a, a very big way that not only that we could eliminate the, the crowding at the courthouse, but the crowding at the jail, a lot of the costs. You know, there, there's a... There's a pretty good line of demarcation between a commissioner's court and what I call the real judges. Mm -hmm. And, you know, think how many we have, uh, district court judges and county court at law yeah, judges. we got about 32 on the criminal side alone. Right. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of them. They're all elected officials on their own. And so uh, we touch on it, but, but we don't get that involved. Yeah, I understand. Makes makes sense. Uh, I can't say I'm really excited about that, but um. so as as part of, of of being commissioner, you're in charge of the purse strings. You know, they say he who controls the money makes the rules, right? Uh, and I'm I'm curious. We spent we spend a little about 158 thousand, roughly two or three you know millions of dollars a year on law enforcement amongst different constables, uh, sheriffs, and that kind of stuff. Is there a way we can? consolidate or you know we have like 14 different constables and I know it's not 14 but it's a lot how can we consolidate that and, and make it more efficient so we can save money and divert it towards other other needs you know I, I have a fascinating report that was done in the mid 1950s the legislature created a, a blue ribbon commission they didn't call it that but that in essence to figure out how to make urban government urban governance more efficient in the rapidly urbanizing Harris County that was the mid-1950s, and one of the things they talked about then was combining law enforcement. Uh, people move here, and I do get asked this question all the time, why do we have a sheriff, a police department, a constable, a metro police, a school police, um, and that's going to have to be addressed, uh, along with, you know, why does the county and the city have libraries? Why does the city, you know, why don't they come into our crime lab? And we have one crime lab, not only for the county, but for the whole region. We're beginning to talk about that because the city has financial woes. If, you know, the county keeps being squeezed, uh, we're going to have to find a way to better deliver services uh, jointly. I want to remind everybody we're about halfway through the program right now. We've uh, got our phone lines open now, 713-807-1794 is the number. Please call in with your questions for Harris County Judge Ed Emmett. Also, send us your questions at HCCLA underscore TV <coughs> on Twitter, and we'll ha ask them here of the judge on the air and, and hopefully get some good answers as we begin in the, the first half of the show here. Um, judge, I want to go back to the indigent issue that we had touched on before. Um, a couple years ago, the county launched the public defender program um, for, for a long time. And I, I was kind of, I've looked at the numbers and be, between the public defender and what we spend on court appointment, court appointed lawyers, uh, the county spends about $50 million, a little over $50 million by my calculations, just on the defense of indigent people in Harris County. Um, 
has the public defender's office been a success, and if so, why? I, I think it has, but I don't think it's been as big a success as we would have hoped. If you go back to the beginning, uh, anybody who watches TV shows, you know, you see the poor public defender being outgunned by the, the private attorney on the other side. Uh, so I think all of us were a little worried about are we going to get the best defense from a public defender? I've not had complaints about that, so I think that's probably going pretty well. But so many of the judges are still doing court-appointed attorneys, and that system, you know, if you read the paper, watch the TV, listen to the radio, there have been some complaints about just who gets appointed and how often and why. Uh, clearly, it can be streamlined, and it should be. But at the end of the day, the, the real purpose of it has got to be giving an adequate defense to the, to the accused. And I've not heard complaints that that's not been improved. So I think we need to keep monitoring it and need to keep working at it. Now, the district attorney's office, their, their total budget predicted for 2015, 2016 is a little over $70 million. Is it reasonable to think that someday we could have a public defender's office that gets close to the budget of the DA's office or, or, or even total that the, that the combined yeah. PD's private appointed attorneys get Well, close. no, because you have to remember the DA deals with everybody, not just the indigents. Mm -hmm. So I think the DA's got a much broader scope than, than just prosecuting indigents. Sure. That makes, that makes total sense. Um, in terms of the expansion of the public defender's office, though, is that on the horizon? I mean, are we going to get, are they going to be able to expand more and take on more cases? That, that is something commissioner's court would, would look at. You know, every, every year we come up with the budget and they make their presentation and, and we listen to it. <laughs> um, we, uh, we, got, we got our first question coming in on Twitter that I want to get to. And, um, our viewer wants to know why did Harris County approve over a hundred thousand dollars for Stingray technology um, in Houston, and do we know enough about it to use it? And do you know what the Stingray tech? Are you familiar with no. it? So did that? Uh, what what is Stingray technology, and who's using it? Well, Stingray technology apparently is being used by law enforcement. We had a show a couple a couple weeks back about how it's being used by law enforcement here in the city of Houston, uh, certainly by HPD and possibly by. Uh, the, the sheriff's office where it's a device that goes around and basically can pull data from people's cell phones. Um, it's made some made some news. Do you don't have anything no. ever come across your desk? Well, if you look at our uh, agenda every week or every other week when the county commissioners meet, you know, we have page after page after page of purchasing contracts. And if the sheriff has come in and made his case among all the staff for something like that, uh, that'll just be approved routinely unless somebody draws it to our attention that it shouldn't be. Are these kind of... Uh, because again, remember, the sheriff's a, a sovereign elected official too, mm -hmm. and he has a budget. And so quite likely, uh, as long as it's within his budget and he wants to, to do it, once we pass his budget, then we don't go in and micromanage. We have another uh, Twitter comment coming in, and uh, this one says, and I don't know if you know, have the statistics on it, but this, this person uh, seems to think that the Harris County Public Defender's Office has a three times better success rate than, than the private attorneys do. Do you have, a, have you seen any statistics? I've, that's I've not heard that, but if, if that's true, that's good news. I mean, that, that would uh, bode well for a, a future Public Defender's Office uh, increase. Are those the kind of things that you would look at in oh, terms of approving the budget absolutely. increase? And, and what what other things would you look at? Because it's all a matter of, of, of efficiency, but again, it's also a matter of uh, the, the person getting an adequate defense. I mean, that that's what we're really about. I mean, even if it costs more, but if you've got a better outcome, then I, I think that's what people deserve. We got, our, we got our first call coming in, so I want to get jump on the phone lines and take our first call. Hello, welcome <coughs> to the HCCA Reasonable Doubt. Hello. Hi. Um, the hospital district is $70 million in the hole. Um, there's some problems. 
don't get me wrong. The, the nurses in the, uh, the system are the best in the, on the planet, and the subspecialists are great. The general practitioners have been rendered mute when the president ripped up their uh, control licenses in 2013, February 1st. But the, uh, the ambulatory director, Brian Reed, Dr. Brian Reed, um, some of his moves are inexplicable, like getting rid of the 24-hour nurse line. I don't know any other system where you can call a nurse and they have their, your chart. It's invaluable. But they cut, they cut it. It's no longer 24 hours. Um, Okay. Well, thank you for your thank you for your call. Um, it's not really a, a criminal justice yeah, question, and, but uh, but I do want to. You talked about indigent health. Yeah, so I, I think I, it's a good segue it's, into it's, that. It, yeah, it's not his exact question. But, right. Uh, remember, the Harris County Hospital District was created back in the 1960s when the old Jeff Davis Charity Hospital was a book was written and and it was a joint city county operation. And the legislature said, okay, Harris County, you're now responsible for indigent health care, and we're going to create this hospital district. They now call themselves Harris Health in order to just try and keep up with the times. Uh, ben Tobb Hospital, LBJ Hospital, uh, you know, if you're shot, Ben Tobb's one of the best places you can want to go, trauma center. But health care's changed. Uh, I don't need to tell you, 20 years ago, it wasn't a big public debate about health care. And so what we're trying to do with the Harris Health is move it out of bricks and mortar and hospitals and more into neighborhood clinics and so that people can establish a medical home. So they don't show up at an emergency room uh, with the flu. You know, they're, they're better off having a regular place they go. They have preventing medicine. And again, back to the area of suburban poverty, where do indigents live? They live all over the county now. So we're, we're trying to get into preventive medicine and just better health care generally. The, the hospital district, ultimately, I think we need to go regional, not just in the county, because I, I use the example all the time of a mother in Fort Bend County back when Fort Bend had a contract with John Seeley Hospital in Galveston to provide their indigent health care. Well, it defies logic that some mother's going to take her infant all the way across Harris County, across the causeway to John Seeley. She's going to stop at the first hospital she comes to, which in her case would probably be Memorial Hermann Southwest. Mm -hmm. And so that's why all this debate about Medicaid expansion, every urban county judge, uh, urban county commissions, they, they all said, we need Medicaid expansion. I don't care what you call it. I mean, uh, it this isn't about the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, whatever they call it. It's about tax dollars that we've already paid to Washington, D.C. being brought back here to help us because who funds indigent health care in Harris County? Property taxpayers of Harris County. So if, if the people really want property tax relief, best thing they can do is have Medicaid expansion. And I've said that to uh, very recently to one of the leaders of one of the local tea parties, and they went, well, you know, that's a perspective I hadn't thought about, but it's true. And if we're going to provide indigent health care, uh, we need to do it efficiently. And if there's federal dollars out there that are available, we need to be accessing those so that we can get better health care and so that we can actually have a, a better deal for our local property taxpayers. And, and Judge Emmett, uh, we segue to the next topic <clears throat> a little bit ahead, of, ahead, but I want to bring you back real fast for a question. Now, uh, Jimmy and I do a lot of indigent defense, and it's, a, it's that one of the things that's, that's a reality for us is we don't have access to experts that uh, a, a more retained attorney might have, and certainly law enforcement has. What would it take to uh, help the defense bar get access to experts for our, our indigent our clients who, of course, can't afford them on their own? You know, you're asking a non-lawyer that question, and that's not something that I just I think I can answer. I can just tell you philosophically, you'd like for the sides to be equal. Well, I guess I mean... And how, how we get there, I, I don't know the answer to that. I want to loop back to our mental health discussion that we started off with um, and, and kind of say, combine that with what you were just talking about with indigent health and the uh, providing those services. 
it seems to me, and I don't know if there's been any thought of this or discussion, but couldn't you use that program, the indigent health program, as and combine it to have that kind of that segue to get the mental health defendants out into the community and, and have these regional centers as kind of a, a halfway house, so well, to speak? Well, in fact, we are working toward that. Uh, the state of Texas did sign up for the what's called a Section 1115 waiver so that we have regional approaches to health care. And part of that Section 1115 waiver, you were able to, they call it DISRIP, but it's, it's basically new programs that the, the federal government will help fund if, if you show that these will be beneficial. And a lot of those are in the mental health area. And one of our viewers on Twitter, they asked, uh, going back to our first segment, they asked, uh, you said that mental health was personally important to you. They wanted to know why. <laughs> uh, when I was 16 years old living in Tyler, Texas, uh, my father, who'd been an oil field worker, was transferred to Houston. And my parents said, you got to move to Houston. I said, you mean after school's out? And they went, no, now. And I went, with five weeks left in my junior year, what? Well, my father had a panic disorder. And I was 16 and had never noticed he'd never been alone. He always had to have somebody with him. Didn't have to be anybody he knew necessarily. And in the 1940s when it hit him, uh, he was brought down to Galveston and they treated him with electric shock treatment. And he went, I ain't doing that anymore. And so he and my mother and friends basically had not self-medicated, there wasn't any medication, but they had created a system. And you know, it never crossed my mind why she always drove him to the office. You know, but so I came down here, and I remember him uh, specifically. You know, he'd, he'd catch the bus, he'd ride downtown to the Humble Building. Uh, they changed the name; he never agreed to that name change. <laughs> uh, and then he'd ride the bus out to Meyerland Mall when he got off, and he'd walk around the mall till she got off work at J.C. Penney's. And I see a lot of these people who are being arrested. You know, if he'd been not dressed like a mid-level oil company. Uh, person, if he'd been a minority, he'd have been arrested for vagrancy time after time after time. So he's probably the perfect example of who we need to be taking care of. So yeah, that's my personal story. How, how do the mental health courts, both misdemeanor and district court, tie into the, the, the jail, over, jail overcrowding system and just your overall plan for indigent defense and indigent health? Well, they are a, a key part of this jail diversion project for sure. Uh, because you, you have to have a judge involved uh, to say, no, that person doesn't go in. And they've been very, very supportive of the whole process of, of keeping people out of jail who their real issue is mental health. The other piece of it, though, and, and we've seen too many tragedies, we have CERT teams, you know, that are trained to deal with, with people who have mental conditions, but the the officer on the scene has to make that call pretty immediately and say, okay, well, I need some help here. And in that case, mental health experts are riding with the CERT team to the, to the spot. Uh, but there, we just don't have enough of them. We've got to put more resources in that area so that we don't end up, uh, you know, basically, you know, killing or severely injuring somebody with a mental condition uh, rather than treating them the way that we should. So with the large number of indigent defendants we have in the jail system, do you think we should have more uh, health courts dedicated to, to uh, indigent defense and to indigent health? Or is one misdemeanor... You mean and mental health? Or? Mental health, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Is one misdemeanor and one district court enough, or do you think we should have more? You know, if the judges asked for more, I'd certainly be supportive of it. But they seem comfortable right now. One of our viewers wants to know, how has the Affordable Care Act impacted Harris County? Um, that's a hard question to answer. The debate over the Affordable Care Act has impacted Harris County, as I said earlier, uh, because we're not drawing down money that's available to us that would allow us to uh, provide more money for the Harris Health System and would allow us then to provide the, the ripple effect. If, if we could cut the property taxes that currently go into indigent health care, because we're pulling down those federal dollars, which are our dollars anyway, 
then some of that money could be spent on some of these other issues that we've talked about tonight. And we could probably give property tax relief to the homeowners at the same time. Another viewer writes in and asks, uh, does Harris County get uh, state or federal dollar for inmates in the Harris County Jail? Is there any grants that come to the jail because of uh, for every inmate? I don't know of any. I mean, I'm going to say something and somebody's going to call in and say, no, that's not right. <laughs> they're they're going to correct you on your but math. It's going to be on I know that there is some state support, but one of the things that uh, we're concerned about, uh, state inmates who are awaiting space tend to end up in the Harris County Jail. We don't get reimbursed for that. But I do chair the juvenile board. I do have actually one, one real tie here to it. And uh, the state does provide a certain amount of money, you know, per person that we keep here uh, that, that we don't have to send to the state. So they'll, they'll fund that. We, we had Judge Mike Schneider from the juvenile board, and I'm glad you brought that up, uh, from the Juvenile Justice Center. He's a judge over there. Um, since you're on the board, what, what improvements do you think can be made to the juvenile system? Well, this is going to sound strange. The best thing that happened was a bond election didn't pass in 2000, maybe been seven, maybe been right after I became county judge, uh, because the juvenile detention center was overcrowded. So it forced us to step back and say, okay, how do we do this better? So we got with the Annie Casey Foundation and we create, worked uh, out the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative. And that has greatly reduced the population, and it's, it's again, a, a way of taking, I used to say, you know, we were taking bad kids and turning them into good criminals. Uh, and now you take a bad kid and you say, okay, that was a mistake. Now we're going to get you out here in this other system. If they show up again, yeah, they come back. Uh, a lot of improvements were made. For example, we uh, used to have what was called the boot camp. Right. And, you know, the, the tough love approach to, to life. Well. It didn't take long to figure out these kids were getting out of there almost like it gave them street cred. Hey, man, I've been through the boot camp. Don't mess with me. So that's now a leadership academy, and I think the outcome's a lot better. Tom Brooks uh, and his staff are doing a great job, and it's all because we were forced to go back and say, is there a better way of doing this? Do, do the initiatives you've, you've talked about as far as energy and health also account for juveniles, or is there something separate you're working on for, for juveniles, I guess both in the system and just in the county, uh, that have uh, health needs and, and are indigent? You mean mental health needs? Mental health needs. Yeah. You keep saying indigent health, and, and yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the people who are coming to the juvenile system are screened, and there's, there's no magic in the fact that if you can identify a mental condition in somebody when they're young, uh, you get ahead of that curve. And if you can then get them stabilized and on the right path, then they don't fall behind in school. They don't just get completely off the track. Because those are the people that end up in the criminal justice system for a lifetime. So it's part of the, uh, the initiative you've done with the legislation to reduce the uh, frequent flyers from the adult level. Does that also help for the juvenile or? or no, it hadn't really been applied to the juveniles because they're pretty well treated right now. I mean, once they're identified, then, then we're able to, to get them the help they need. You're dealing with a much, much smaller population there. Right, right. But you're also dealing and with... And you're also dealing with people, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so many of the frequent flyers in the adult world are homeless. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're out on the streets. The juveniles, that's not the case. Which kind of leads me to my next question. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, as far as the shelters and mental health, a lot of persons with mental health are homeless. What, what by way of county do you know do we, can we do for that or is, or is being done for that to kind of get them off the street and, and away from the normal crimes we see of trespass and, and that sort of thing? We're, you know, working with the various housing authorities and the various nonprofits. Uh, we're just woefully short. Uh, of resources, but we're getting there and it's improving. And, and people are, like I said earlier, people of all political stripes are now saying, you know, mental health's an issue we got to deal with. And, and I think there's been a huge improvement. It would improve a lot more if, if the legislature would suddenly, they, they increased funding two years ago, they're increasing funding in the budgets this year, so that we're going the right direction. And I'm just going, speed it up, and let's go a little faster. And when we talk about mental health, you know, there's always a gradient. You're, 
it's not just lim or is it just limited to I guess the more severe of the mental health or is this open for anyone with a diagnosed mental health issue? Well, go back to my father's example. You know, he was a completely functioning mid-level oil company guy, you know, in accounts payable. Uh, nobody even knew there was an issue, uh, but he dealt with it. Uh, some homeless vet that's on the street with the same circumstance doesn't have the support group to deal with it, and we've got to provide that support group. I want to move uh, in the time, time we have left here and also ask you about <coughs> another uh, court that's been created, and that's the new prostitution court. Uh, and it touches on some of these same issues of mental health and uh, and I, as I understand it, there's been a, a misdemeanor prosti prostitution court that's been set up, right. uh, which has about, right now, I think the budget has, there's a, there's a grant given for $435,000. I don't, I didn't see any more money, but um, given for it. But it, this is also another avenue of which we're trying to address what the real problem is and, and, and take those people out of the criminal court, correct? Right, and f you know, for too long, uh, you know, if you've lived in Houston, Harris County for any length of time, whenever the media gets bored, somebody will go out and they'll go, there's prostitution here. Right. Well, you know, no kidding. But the, the, the trend has always been you go arrest the women and maybe a couple of the guys that are in there, but you never really get to the people who are engaged in the human trafficking and things like that. And I know the sheriff, county attorney Vince Ryan, the district attorney, Devin Anderson, they're, they're all focused on approaching prostitution appropriately. And it, it's, it's not that different from mental health. You know, we used to say, mental health, there's something wrong with you, we don't want to see you. And prostitution, we approached with, well, you're the bad people. Well, in fact, it was the, the traffickers and the pimps and those guys that we ought to be going after. And I, I think this court is designed uh, like so many of the courts, where the judge can take the the woman, for example, and change her life uh, and not make her criminal the rest of her life and say, look, I'm going to give you a break. We're going to get you on the straight path. We have another call coming in that I want to get to. Hello, thank you for calling HCCLA Reasonable Doubt. Yes, I was thinking we could preserve the dome by uh, reducing it down to the skeletal structure and making a park. I'll hang up. Thanks. <laughs> we can't. We can't have you on a show without the Astrodome coming. Absolutely. Up, so. uh, you know, when I became judge, it, it had been decided the dome was going to be converted into a hotel, and that didn't work. Those two guys, uh, the people that had the contract, didn't have money. They never built a hotel. So suddenly the dome got back on the county's plate. Uh, there have been so many ideas suggested. But I do think the idea is gaining traction now. And, and what the gentleman just said isn't far off from what we're talking about, uh, whether it's the, the skeletal or not. But you, you, you keep the roof, you keep it covered, you raise the playing field up to ground level so it's easier to use, and you have nine acres under cover that the rodeo can use and OTC can use, and it will be, if, if this plan develops, it will be really a park. Like any other park, it'll just be covered. Uh, we have 75 to 100 festivals and gatherings a year here. How many of those would like to know that they're weatherproof? Sure. So well, I, I do have to ask actually, though because the just two me, I, I don't, hold on to the dome question because I want to ask one more question about the mental health courts and, and prostitution courts because the dome issue is important. <laughs> but uh, along with mental health and prostitution, there's also a, a drug issue. So do you foresee any kind of funding for helping those people who don't have mental health issues but have drug issues and maybe we can stop the, the crowding with the, with the jails as well. Well, you know, uh, behavioral issues and substance abuse issues and mental health all kind of come together. And so we need to treat them all okay. simultaneously. Flip so, back to the dome. Let's go to the dome. Real quick. But, um, 2013, it gets put to a vote. The voters of Harris County, by 53%, uh, say we're, we're against doing anything with the dome. And I think your quote at the time was, we can't allow the once proud Astrodome to sit like a resting ship in the middle of a parking lot. This was the best effort and the voters turned it down. My question is, 
18 months later, why is this still even an issue? Why are we still looking for solutions? Why hasn't it just been torn down? Well, number one, we can't. We would have to get the permission of the Texas Historical Commission to do it. Number two, it would cost tens of millions of dollars to tear it down. And at the end of that, you have nothing. Uh, it's fully paid for. Uh, and so it hasn't been sitting there like a rusting ship. It's been power washed. It's been repainted. Uh, from the outside, frankly, it doesn't look that bad anymore. And so it's an asset that belongs to the taxpayers of Harris County, and we need to find the best use for it that the tenants, namely the rodeo, uh, can, can make use of also. But, you know, beginning six years ago, I told people I could achieve world peace, solve all the mental health and indigent health issues in the world, and people are still going to focus on whether or not you tore down the Astrodome. <laughs> it's a building. You know, it's a building. And while I'm in favor of keeping it and I want to use it as an asset, uh, I've, I've been, I started out amused, I'm less than amused now, at just how strongly people feel about a building. Well, well I think you're going to find a lot of people who that was their first <laughs> baseball game or well, their first football game. No, I understand game, people feeling strongly to keep it. Yeah. But when I have, I mean, my favorite, I got a letter just last week. I voted for you for the last 20 years. I'm never going to vote for you again if you don't tear down the dome. Well, I've only been in office eight years. They voted for me for the last 20. <laughs> Maybe they're t talking about 12 years in the future, they're going to vote for you as well. Yeah, well. <laughs> so if you can, if with money aside, it, what, would you, what would you do with the dome? If you had it your way, you can draw up whatever plan you want, what would you draw up for the I dome? I think where we're going is uh, a park that literally is a park. You can use free unless it's been leased out to somebody, and during the rodeo, of course, it's leased out to them. And above that park, you create some kind of a conservancy like any other park that would uh, build the venues as, as they become available, whether it's a museum. We live in the energy capital of the world, and there's no energy museum here. There's one in Midland, there's one in Kilgore, but there's not one in Houston. Uh, we could have an entertainment venue, similar to Cynthia Woods Mitchell. The Mountain Biking Association has already said they want to be in there. You can put all kinds of hiking and, and, and power walking and those kind of things in. And so my idea would be that the county build a park and then the rest of it be developed and constantly change. You know, 40 years from now, they're going to want some other things in there overlooking that park, just like Discovery Green will change. So are we at a point where any changes have to come by, by way of vote, or is there anything you can do without going through vote? It depends on how much private funding we get. Uh, I think there will have to be at some point a bond election. I mean, in an ideal world, some... Uh, philanthropist would come in and say, you know what, here's the money to build that park, in which case we would all cheer mightily. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, then I think we're looking, looking at a bond, but not for all the upper levels. I think that's where you turn it over to something like a conservancy. So if I were to give you that money, could it be the uh, Damon Parish Dome? Absolutely. The Astrodome? <laughs> the, it could be the Damon Parish Park inside the Astrodome. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we only have a minute left of our, our show here, so I want to thank you, Judge Emmett, for it's coming my on. It's it, It's been real enlightening to, to see just how the county works um, in terms of a day-to-day -day operations and, and how things actually do come across your desk. Um, I, I really hope you come back on our show again and, and that we can discuss some more issues and and talk about this a lot further. You know, I'd be happy to. We didn't even get to the main role of the county judge, and that's Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Exactly. And we'll, we'll like to get that to the next time. So for, Homeland uh, Security, is, that's a big one. That's right. So for my co-host, Damon Parrish, thank you all for joining us tonight. We'll see you next week on HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt.